Well, good morning, Shannon Oaks family. Wow. You know, there's that line in the movie uh, that Kevin Costner so famously made about the baseball field and the cornfield, Field of Dreams, when his daddy asked, is this heaven? <laughs> and uh, that's kind of the feeling I had this morning so far already. Uh, it's just a... Uh, it's just amazing to see what's what's happening in in our in our church and and how God's spirit is just moving so mightily and that's he gets all the praise we don't get it he gets it and uh, it's just it's a blessing to be a part of that wave right now as his spirit moves through uh, this church if you are here this morning uh, and did not receive a program or a card. These are really important, but we've got some folks who are going to get you one right now because we're going to use these in just a minute in our service. Did anyone not get a program when they came? Raise your hand. We'll get you one. Anyone back here? Raise your hand. The very back back here. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, a little bit about these cards. If you would, during the service, just reflect on what God's doing in your life or some things that you have on your heart. Put your name on this card, and then just fill out a praise to God to thank him, maybe a request. I had someone come up to me this morning and say this to me, and I'd like to share their testimony about the card. Two weeks ago, she was having really difficulty in even standing and walking because of imbalance issues. And so she put on her card, just pray God would help me with my balance, and all those issues are now gone. See, what happens when, when you fill this card out, we submit this to our prayer team, and they begin to pray over whatever you're going on in your life. It might be a relationship concern you have. It might be a praise. It might be, as I just mentioned, a health struggle. But whatever's going on in your life, if you'll put it on here, we will begin to immediately pray for that. At the end of our service, we're going to pass baskets, and those baskets will be for our prayer cards. And just to make an offering, God, this is who I am. I'm here today. I just want to offer this uh, to, to you. I, I mentioned how God is blessing us. Uh, this last week, one of our other young people here uh, at Shannon Oaks, Stuart McFarland, uh, was baptized uh, into Christ here at Shannon Oaks. Is Stuart in here this morning? Is Stuart in here? Let's stand up. Good, Stuart. Stuart, we love you, and we can't wait to see what the Lord's going to do with your life, buddy. Thank you. Stuart's a sweet soul. He's a seventh grader at Sulphur Springs Middle School. And then also uh, that same night, Alex Collins was baptized into Christ. Is Alex in here this morning? Alex in here? Oh, okay. Well, here's a picture of him. He's one of the sweetest young men you ever want to meet. Uh, God's going to do amazing things in Alex's life. He goes to Como Picton. Uh, and lives out at Journey Road, but we are so, so thankful for Alex's uh, commitment as well. It began in 1692, February of that year, and it would go on for the next 15 months, all the way through May of 1693 in the colony of Massachusetts. It was called the Salem Witch Trials. And when it was done, 19 people would be dead, hung there in Salem, accused of witchcraft. Five men, 14 women. One scholar said this, the episode is one of colonial America's most notorious cases of mass hysteria. Another said this, The Salem Witch Trials was the rock on which theocracy was shattered. That is, where the church rules supreme even in political matters. But what's so tragic about the Salem Witch Trials is just a few years later, of the 14 women that were hung, 
11, without a doubt, by their communities were found to all be innocent. They were just sham trials. We're in the process of looking at our Lord Jesus go through 16, I'm sorry, six trials just like that. We saw a couple of them last week among the Jews. This morning, we're going to move the trial. It's going to go before the Romans. And actually, we're going to spend two weeks on this. Uh, I had planned to put at the top of your program, John 18, 28 through 40, and then planned to put next week, John 19 as well. Inadvertently, I just put 19. So if you want to, with your pen or pencil, just at the top of your program, if you would add these verses, John 18, that's where we're going to start today, and we'll end next week in John 19, because Jesus is going to be in front of this one man twice. Let's start reading in John 18, and we're going to start in verse 28. Then the Jewish leaders took Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. This Roman governor, his name is Pilate. And the palace they go to is really called the Praetorian. And this is a place that simply means the headquarters for the leader of that area. He usually, Pilate was, was about 80 miles away in Caesarea. But whenever there was some big festival or, or something like Passover, for fear of a Jewish uprising, he would travel those 80 miles. And notice what it says about the people that took him there. They took him to the place of the Roman governor, but now it was early morning, and to avoid ceremonial uncleanliness, they did not enter the palace because they wanted to be able to eat the Passover. If you've been in this series, you've noticed where we've been. We've been moving toward the Passover, and now it's it's 6 a.m. on Thursday. And now throughout the land, 250,000 lambs are beginning to be slain so that several million can partake that afternoon of the Passover meal. And these men who are convinced they're going to have Jesus crucified and killed, these people who are just living out hypocrisy and uncleanliness in their lives on the inside don't want to enter the palace because they fear there might be leavened bread in there that might make them unclean. And so to give you a picture this morning of what this scene is like, I have up here a chair, and we'll just call this the chair of Pilate. And in here, we'll just consider this the praetorium the place where Jesus is going to come before Pilate. And just outside our foyer, outside the doors, there are all the Jews out there. Jesus in here can hear them out there. But they won't come in here. And you're going to see this morning how Pilate is going to go in here and out there, in here and out there, in here and out there, as he goes between the Jews out there and Jesus here on the inside. They have come to present Jesus for the death penalty. They said his original crime was blasphemy, but that's not going to make it for the Romans as it relates to death. And so now they've upped the charge, this false charge, to treason because they say he wants to incite a resurrection because he says he is a king. Verse 29. So Pilate came out to them. So he's leaving where we are in here, and he's going out to them. Let's talk just for a second, because he's going to be our main character for the next two weeks in his relationship with what happens to Christ. Let's talk about who was Pilate. Who was this guy? He was the Roman governor of Judea from 26 to 36 A.D. He served under the emperor Tiberius. Most of us know Pilate for this reason. 
He was the one condemning Jesus to death. Both Roman, though, and Jewish historians give us some insight on what he was like as a person. And this is what they say. He was tactless, undiplomatic, brutal, violent. He resolved almost every problem in front of him with the sword. In fact, in 1961, archaeologists discovered what was called the the Pilate Stone, and there it says, Pilate, prefect of Judea. My, my son Chandler and my son Hutton, they love movies, and they always come to me and they say, Dad, you got to go see this movie, but spoiler alert, you ever hear that, that phrase, spoiler alert? In other words, they're going to tell me about the movie before I see it. Well, I'm going to give you a spoiler alert for the next two weeks. Here's a spoiler alert about what you're going to see in Pilate. He is going to ignore his true convictions. By the way, as you look at this list, see, do you think about anybody in the world or do you think about any country or any, any group of people? He ignored his true convictions. He chose political expediency. And he failed to recognize the truth. In the Bible, what we have here, we have Pilate. And he's going to be mentioned exclusively as it relates to the trials of Jesus. And the gospel we're in, John's gospel alone, is going to record the conversation that Jesus has with him. So Pilate comes out, verse 29. He comes out to them and he asks, What charges are you bringing against this man? If he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. So Pilate comes out, and when he comes out, he says, what charges do you have against Jesus? They weren't ready for that question. You say, Jeff, why wouldn't they be ready for that question? Because Pilate had already given them the cohort. Remember that, that, that phrase we used that went to the garden to arrest Jesus, he'd already given them the cohort. So in their mind, they think, this is just a slam deal. We're just going to slam duck this deal, get Jesus convicted, get him crucified. And Pilate has thrown them for a curve. And so you can see what the reaction is here. Well, well, uh, well, well if he weren't a criminal, we, uh, we would not have brought him to you. Now, verse 31 tells us this. Pilate said, take him yourself and judge him by your own law. But we have no right to, look at this, they've already decided what, what his fate is. We have no right to execute anyone, the Jews objected. This happened so that the words Jesus had spoken indicating the kind of death he was going to die would be fulfilled. The Jews could only stone. Romans never stoned. But Jesus is going to be crucified. He's going to be crucified. And so what we're going to do this morning is we're going to go through this trial with Jesus on this day one. Next week we'll do day two. But this trial with Jesus and I want you to take your program, I want you to open it up, and I'm going to show you four things that are going to happen in this trial today. And I want you to see how they so relate with us as believers as Satan tries to attack us. Now, what we're going to look at, we're going to look at what's called the Roman Code of Criminal Procedure. There's going to be four major steps that Pilate is going to follow. And as you go through this, this is what you're going to realize as I... As I unveil this to you as I, as I share more with you, how Satan tries to take us to these same four steps. But you ought to rejoice in that. This is what the Apostle Paul says. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. So as we go through these four things and you look at what's going on with you personally, or others who are believers in Christ, just realize you're sharing in the same thing that Jesus shared with. So, here we go. 
we both are going to experience, you're going to see Jesus here and you're going to see in your life, we're both going to experience accusations. What does that mean? Well, Jesus was just accused. In fact, verse 30, remember what we said, if he were not a criminal, we wouldn't have brought him to you. They're accusing Jesus of, of an offense that would end in death, and he's totally innocent. Accusations. It is one of Satan's greatest strategies for your life and my life. He is the accuser. He wants you to believe at times, and some of you have felt this way, that you are worthless. But listen to me, church. When you leave here this morning, you're going to know two things. You're going to know who you are, and you're going to know whose you are. And that's going to make all the difference as you leave this place today. We're going to fight Satan this morning, as did Jesus. So here's a reality. The accuser wants you to doubt who you are. And here's what you can know about Satan. In fact, when next year when we get into Matthew, we're really going to dig into this, but we're just going to hit it quickly this morning. Here's what you can know about Satan. From the very beginning, this has been his strategy both with Jesus and with us. In Jesus' earthly ministry, it was a strategy from the very beginning, and it's going to be, continue to be a strategy with us. After Jesus was baptized and the voice of God said, This is my son whom I love and whom I'm well pleased. It said that the Spirit of God led him into the desert to be tempted. In Mark's gospel, it's a very powerful verb that says the Spirit literally hurled Jesus into the desert. And there you know he's there for 40 days. Now notice what Satan does when he comes to Jesus. Temptation one. I know you're starving. I know you're hungry. I know you fasted. But if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Notice how he starts the sentence. If you are. I'm telling you what's going to happen to you and I both. He's going to continue to question you. He's going to continue to put doubts in your mind about who you really are. And then the second temptation if you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down. He took him to this incredible high point of the temple. It was over 500 feet high. Josephus said if you were on top of it, it would make you giddy or dizzy. It was so high. And Jesus says, throw yourself down, and they'll make you king. Take this shortcut. If you are. If you are. He wants you to doubt who you are. He wants you to doubt whose you are. But he didn't stop there. The accuser all wants, he wants you to believe this. He's got a better plan for you than the Lord does. I mean, look what he does here in 8 and 9 of chapter, Matthew chapter 4. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this he said, I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. I've got a better plan for you. You don't need the slow, long road to the cross. Take my plan. And Satan comes with us every day in the same way. If you'll do what I say, I promise you, you'll be better. So here's what I want to do. On our website, I'm going to put a link to this. Because if you struggle in this area, I'd encourage you to get uh, this book by Sandy Freed. In this book, she lays out eight lies that Satan tries to use to destroy you spiritually. He says, I will comfort you. Shame on you. Listen to my whispers. Let me build my fortress in your mind. Wear my garments. Seat me in your high place. God does not remember you. You are not loved. Again, I'll put a link on our website, and you can go right to this book and order this book. Now. Those are all lies. 
Let me tell you who you really are. I love this book by Neil Anderson, Victory Over the Darkness. In it, in this one place, he lists 33 truths of who we are. I'm not going to read all of them, but let me just read a few. Listen, I'm describing you this morning. This is who you are. I'm God's child. I'm Christ's friend. (laughs) I've been justified. I'm united with the Lord. I am one in spirit with him. I have been bought with a price. I belong to God. I'm a member of Christ's body. I am a saint. I've been adopted as God's child. I have direct access to God through the Holy Spirit. I have been redeemed and forgiven of all my sins. Love of God. This week, I'm going to make for you guys, if you just go to our website, it'll be a Loom video. It'll be all 33 of these truths that I will speak to you with the supporting text that goes with it. Just go watch that and watch what happens to your day this week. This is who you really are. And the accuser does not want you to know that. What else did Jesus experience? The next part of the Roman code was called interrogation. Now, as we define interrogation and as it was used here, let me give you a definition for that. It's being questioned to be proved wrong or guilty. And it always has a bias at the person who's doing the interrogating. And this is what's coming at Jesus. Look in verse 33. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew, Pilate replied? Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it that you have done? Pilate has no interest in knowing about who Jesus really is. And Jesus can tell that. That's why I said, who who gave you this information? You don't care about this. I'm here as a pawn for you and your political expediency. That's the reason you're interrogating me right now. You're coming after me through interrogation. I'm telling you, when you start standing for Jesus, just get ready. People are going to start to turn the truth and interrogate you and try and flip you upside down because they hate what you stand for. This last week, I went to a website that's really powerful, and I'll put a link to this on as well. It's called The Persecution of Christians on College Campuses. Some of you have kids that are about to go to college. Maybe they're right now. J. Stephen Lee himself is a college professor from the Metroplex. So he speaks from what he knows. This is what he says in his research that he did. He's done extensive research. 53% of college professors, listen, admitted to having unfavorable feelings toward Christians. 53. That means your kids are sitting in a classroom. Over half those teachers have a bias against your child if in any way they show Jesus is their Lord. And so on his website, He put down 75 examples of how the students are being interrogated and persecuted on campuses. I'm just going to share one with you. I'm not going to name the school. You go to the website and you find out. But it's a very prominent school here in in North Texas, in the Metroplex. This is one of the 75 incidents he quotes. During a pro-life prayer vigil... Students on campus came to those praying and screamed, F your God. And then on the video, you can hear and see a professor, a professor on campus, yell at the kids praying, 
I love sacrificing children. It is my favorite pastime. I'm telling you, they're coming for our kids. They're coming for their minds. And Satan is using all kinds of people to do that. When you stand for Jesus, when you live out his word, you will be interrogated by the forces of Satan and by this world. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 5, 11 and 12, Blessed are you, not if. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So we've seen in this Roman code, there's accusation, there's interrogation. Write this down. Number three, both you and I and Jesus bring forth a defense. What was Jesus' defense? What did Jesus say as he went through these first two steps? In verse 36 of John 18, he says this. My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into this world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of the truth listens to me. Jesus says, here's my defense. This world's not my home. <laughs> I'm just passing through. My kingdom's in another place. And those here who accept me and know me, they know the truth. They respond to the truth. They listen to the truth. Do you remember last week I used the example in, in Acts chapter 4 of, of Peter and John, and they were standing before the Sanhedrin, 70 guys surrounded them, the most powerful guys in the nation around them, and, and I just gave you verse 13. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized they were unschooled, ordinary people, they realized and took note these men had been with Jesus. But the question is, what did they do for those guys to say that? What did they do? I'm going to tell you what they did. They spoke the truth. They spoke the truth. Verse 12 they told the Sanhedrin this. Can you imagine? <laughs> Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Listen to me, church. Jesus is the answer to your problems. He is the answer to your business problems. He's the answer to your relationship problems. He's the answer to your problems raising your kids. He's the answer to your marriage problems. Jesus is the answer. And when people are struggling and they come to you, you need to be able to share that with them. You need to be able to defend the very faith that you have. That's why this next year, starting in June, we're going to spend one year from Matthew 1-1 going all the way through the 28th chapter of Matthew, walking with Jesus step by step, because when you finish that year with me, you will be able to defend your faith to anybody. Why, Jesus Christ is my Lord. R.C. Sproul said this, Defending the faith to the best of our ability is not a luxury or an indulgence in intellectual vanity. It is the task given to each of us as we bear witness to our faith before the world. This is how people come to know Jesus. As we share with them. If you can't do that yet, let me help you. We'll do it together. We'll learn together. And finally, the fourth part of this Roman code was this. We both receive a verdict. Now, at first... It looks like Jesus has a good verdict. Because look, if you look in, in 1838, look what happens. Pilate says, what is truth? And with this, he didn't even stop to listen to Jesus' answer. 
He says, what is truth? And with this, he just goes back outside. So here's Jesus. Pilate says, what is truth? And before Jesus can answer, he's out the door, out with the Jews. Jesus can hear the mob out there. He can hear what's going on. He gets out there, and he says this. He went out again to the Jews gathered there and said, I find no basis for a charge against him. I thought you were bringing me a revolutionary, a terrorist. I don't see any of that in Jesus. Verse 39. But it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? He thought he had an out here. Just let me release him. Oh, they said, wow. Yeah, we want you to release somebody, but not Jesus, not him. Give us Barabbas. Now, Barabbas had taken part in an uprising. Let me tell you about Barabbas. His name means son of Abba. And we learn a lot about Barabbas when we read our Bible. He was a well-known, little-loved mercenary. John's gospel says he was a robber. Acts says he was a murderer. Luke said he led an insurrection against Rome. Matthew said he was notorious, a famous troublemaker. In other words, he is the son of the father, all right. He is the son of the father of lies. And the crowd says, Jesus is right here. The crowd is just outside our doors. And he hears the screams. Release Barabbas, not him. Think about that. The son of the father of lies was being set free. And the son of God was being found guilty. I think there's much about Barabbas in our lives. And the verdict that you and I receive is that we too are set free. We are set free. I love what Paul says in Romans chapter 5, verse 9. Because when I think of Jesus standing right here and Pilate right there, and Jesus knowing at any moment he could have called down a legion of angels and be freed from all that was about to happen to him. But he didn't do that. In Romans 5, verse 9, look what Jesus says about you. You Listen to me. You were destined to hell except for this. An eternity in hell except for this. Look what it says. Since we have now been justified. Jeff, what does justified mean? It means when God looks at you, think of every bad thing you've ever done. In this room, there are lots of bad things. I can start with me. Think of every bad thing you've ever done. What does justified mean? It means when God looks at you, it's just as if that never happened happened. How is that possible? How can God look at me and say, no, no, I don't see any guilt in you at all. How can he do that? Here's the answer. We're justified by his blood. We're justified by his blood. What Jesus is about to go through in the next several weeks in this series He did this because he had you in mind. Whether you're in here and you're a believer this morning or whether you're in here and you've never accepted Christ as your Lord, let me tell you, he did it for you. When he hung on the cross, he died for you so that you would be set free and live with him forever in glory instead of forever in an eternal hell. So Paul says, how much more Shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? This morning, we've seen a lot. We've seen a baptism. We talked about two other baptisms. We've seen an accuser, and we've seen he's a liar, and we've seen who we are, and we've seen whose we are, and we've seen Jesus is the answer.
Here's what I want to ask you a question this morning. Are you struggling in some way in your life? Is there any struggle you have? I want you to think about your business right now. Are you struggling? What about your relationships, maybe with friends? Are you struggling? What about relationships with someone close to you? Maybe your children, maybe your spouse, maybe a fellow church member here. Are you struggling? Jesus is the answer. We're going to have prayer warriors down here, and they want to pray with you this morning. Don't leave here with anything on your shoulders. Give it to the Lord this morning. Let's all stand and let's sing. Let the Lord move in your heart. Come if you need to come for prayer this morning.